important and provocative, though I think it leaves some questions um, aside. Uh, in my own perspective, and it's just sort of the last remark of mine, is all this terrifies the wits out of me. My basic starting point is that whenever you allow very major innovations in the financial and monetary system, it always ends badly for about a century. And at, at the end of that, you sort of work out what to do about it. And by then, civilization, civilization is almost, gone. almost gone. Then civilization is almost gone. Then civilization is almost gone. So I am not being facetious. I'm being absolutely serious. So I think that anybody who isn't worried the hell out of a world in which Facebook runs the monetary system, or maybe the Amazon, uh, then they're just not paying attention. Um, so, um, the way we get the panel, I have, um, oh, we have four people. Uh, um, it's Mark, are you still in the panel? Are you going to be participating in the panel? Would you want to? Good idea. Uh, but perhaps at the end. So, uh, in the Q&A, perhaps. So, we've got to my left, Stefan Ingvers of the Swedish Riksbank, um, the oldest central bank in the world. Yes, so you know all about the consequences of innovation. I'm sure you've made mistakes many times. To his left is uh, Hyun Song Ching, who I've known for a very long time, uh, who used to be a very, very distinguished, enormously brilliant academic, and for some reason has become a bureaucrat. I still can't work this out. And, and, and third, uh, Simon Potter, who many of you will know from the New York Fed, where he was executive director, so is that your head, and the head of the, um, yeah. So, um, uh, the way we're going to do this is we have, uh, we're going to just have a discussion. It's not going to be a lot of sp speeches. I'm proposing that we have proposed that we will um, divide into two segments. The first segment will discuss um, how digital technology is set to transform the monetary into a lesser degree financial system. So taking on from what Marcus was just talking about. And the second section will be about how they expect the public sector, the official sector, particularly central banks, but not exclusively, to respond and how they think it should respond. Each segment will be about 25 minutes and then we'll have a discussion. Now, some of you might have noticed that we haven't done fantastically well on timekeeping, but my view is the past is bygone. So we are still going to have our full length of seminar. And that means that you're not going to have very much time for drinking afterwards, but you might have enough time to sink a few glasses of wine to get over the horror. Um, so on the... Um, so the first section, session, the next section then, um, uh, will be on how this could unfold. Each panelist will speak for about four minutes, then we have a discussion among them, then we'll move on to the next thing, and then there'll be lots of brilliant questions from you. And to start off the first section, Hyun. Well, thank you, Martin, and uh, thank you to the Peterson Institute for laying on this uh, uh, very timely and very interesting event. It's been an uh, extremely rich discussion so far, and uh, I've, I've certainly learned a lot. Um, We've talked a lot about technology, um, but I think it's very important for us to keep in mind the technology in the context of the architecture. So uh, the tech is one thing, uh, but architecture is about what we do. Tech is about how we do it. And I think, of course, clearly uh, the technology is, in, uh, is enabling, and that will actually have, a, have an influence on the architecture. But it doesn't always have to. And uh, I think a very good example is uh, account-based money. And uh, I think it's worth thinking about the origin of accounts um, back in, uh, well, I, I suppose uh, account-based money really took off in, 50, uh, in 16th and uh, 17th century Europe, um, where the idea is that uh, there is an intermediary, uh, both the sender and the receiver have accounts at this intermediary, it's typically a bank, and the sender and the sender's account is debited, and the receiver's account is credited. And that's a very elegant solution. Uh, now, uh, that architecture is pretty much in place right now. It's just that the technology has made that functioning much more efficient, very rapid, and very, and very much more convenient. I mean, if you're in Sweden, um, and uh, you have a bank account, which most people have access to, there is this, um, this digital app called Swish, uh, extremely convenient. Just one swipe of the, uh, 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 just you know, one swipe on the mobile phone, and the payment is made. Uh, it's very much based on the banking sector. It's very much based on the two-tier banking system, where uh, the payment goes through 
um, one account at one bank to a, another account at another bank, and it's settled on the central bank's balance sheet. But the technology has, of course, made it much more convenient, uh, and the look and feel uh, is extremely um, uh, sort of seamless. So I think that's a very good example of how the, you know, the architecture can remain pretty much constant, but the technology enables you to do much more. Now, we're here because technology has um, stirred up a number of other debates. And I think uh, there are two issues that I think which have really um, been uh, very important in making this topic particularly topical. One is that uh, uh, we have a way of um, making payments which doesn't need the, the account-based money, which is uh, uh, based on a decentralized consensus. Uh, we typically call it a token currency, but it's not really, I mean, that's really a shorthand. What it does is it's a list, and the list is shared among everyone in the network. Uh, there's a, there's a, in Bitcoin, it's a completely open system where you can come in and uh, be a member of this network. But it's just a list that keeps track of uh, where a particular unit of value has been transferred. And uh, technologically, I think this is a leap because you don't need to debit one person's account and credit another person's account. I think this has really occasioned a very stimulating debate. Now, uh, it doesn't need to be Bitcoin, which is, uh, like a, you know, which is an open DLT system. It can be a permission DLT system, as many central banks have also experimented with. Um, but this tech development has been a, a very important development. The, the second development, I think, is, uh, as uh, Governor Brainerd mentioned, uh, the importance of uh, big tech companies that have come into financial services. And big tech is characterized by what uh, we, in, the, um, in this year's annual economic report, call the DNA loop, the data network activities loop. So big tech firms already have an established base, either in search, in e-commerce, or in social media, and then they're leveraging their network in providing financial services. And so the entry uh, is much easier, and there's a potential where there could be a tipping point where uh, they could become uh, very important players in very short time. And if so, uh, they would become really, you know, very, um, uh, very important market participants, even dominant perhaps. And that could actually change the competitive landscape in a way which may be detrimental to uh, to something which is a, a, um, a more competitive, transparent system. And I think this has also occasioned a lot of debate. Now, in the um, so Martin has been a very uh, tough uh, chairman. He, uh, I did, I do have a, a slide deck which has been distributed to you, um, and in that slide deck, what you'll find is that uh, in a in um, a in a typical advanced economy, and and there you have a, an example of the member countries of, of the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructure, which is a BIS committee that oversees the payments uh, space. Typically, wholesale payments are of the order of 50 to uh, 60 times GDP. That's to say, in a given year, if you just count up the, uh, the, the amount of payments that go through um, the, the central bank overseeing system, you have uh, quantities that are, are vastly larger than uh, than GDP itself. That's wholesale payments. The retail payments turns out to be a much smaller, a very much smaller component of that. And um, if we were to try and replicate that with a, uh, a stable coin, for example, where it's pre-funded, so you deposit money into a, a wallet and then spend only the money that you have, we are thinking of uh, a, a wallet that would be an enormous wallet where you have very, very large sums. And in macroeconomics, that's called a cash in advance economy. If you try to operate the modern financial system as a cash in advance system, you would really uh, come up against big bottlenecks. The reason why uh, the central bank-based system works so well is because people trust the central bank. And when the central bank uh, offers a deposit uh, as an overdraft, um, the you're creating a loan uh, that's backing the deposit, but uh, in a daylight overdraft, which is typically what happens in a wholesale payment system, uh, that daylight overdraft is granted to a bank, let's say, because uh, the bank can make a large payment even though the balances that the bank has at the central bank 
doesn't cover the full amount of that payment. Um, because the, um, the timing of payments will be such that at the end of the day, you will have all the accounts uh, being balanced. And I think this um, gives us a very useful introduction to the question of what is the appropriate division of labor between the public sector and the private sector. Um, to the extent that, uh, as Mark has also mentioned, the public sector is very good at providing a backbone to the system which is trusted, and the private sector can plug into that system in a way that's conducive to competition, in a way that's transparent, and in a way uh, where the private sector can do what it does best, which is the customer-oriented activity, to, uh, to um, unleash its innovative capacity in serving customers well, improving customer experience, and uh, serving uh, the needs of everyday uh, users of the financial system. That would be, I think, a very um, you know, good benchmark for us to uh, start this discussion. There may be a, uh, some scope for CBDCs, and, and perhaps we can come back to that at the end. But I think the, um, uh, uh, I would go back, so I would sort of finish with my first point, which is it's, it's very important that we distinguish um, the technology from the architecture. So the tech is something that is an instrumental goal. It's not an end in itself. And I think it's very much, uh, uh, it, uh, it's incumbent on us to bear that in mind. Thank you, John, is very, very helpful. And um, the way you've thought about it, um, it pr presents us with a different perspective. Let's get back to that very soon. Simon. So I read your paper four times and I'm still learning. Hyun has been fantastic. The, his presence in Basel has really helped that central bankers understand some of these issues, and there are deep issues. In the wholesale system, which you talked about, the progress over the last 30 years has been massive. So Fedwire, that does payment securities, that's going to do GDP of the US within a week. That was your point. That's $22 trillion. That, that is an amazing change. There will be innovation in wholesale markets. I find it hard to believe the distributed ledgers, except for safety and soundness, will add that much compared to the account-based money that we've seen there and the role that central banks have. Now, uh, these high-value payment systems, there's been a lot of work to make sure, because they are the backbone, that they work under a number of cases. For example, if there's a terrorist attack, a power outage. And we understand how to do that well. That means they've got to be geographically diverse. You'll be able to switch over well. There's a different problem if there's a cyber attack on them. This is a really hard problem to deal with. So I turned off my phone now. And suppose the large value payment system is, is turned off for two hours at most, right? That's what the BIS told people. Can this be turned back on? And it looks the same to me, but instead of it being the Apple operating system, it's an Android one because that's been compromised. That's a big challenge that we're going to have to deal with over, over the next few years, because we know that these cyber threats are, are, are present. So what the world is going to look like might be a lot about how to fight against cyber, because we are digital much more than we were, were before. The cash is not going to be a solution to that, physical cash. But in a local sense, it, it certainly can be. So if we're all using phones to trade, trade money, better hope the power system's up. Because if it's not up, it's going to be a problem. And one thing I'm pretty sure about mine is in 10 years' time, if I go to any country in the world and I give them this token, most people will know what this token is. For smaller countries, they might not, but it's a $20 bill if you can't see it. And this will work reasonably, really well, because the network effect of the US dollar is going to be very hard to change over time. The first time people in one of these countries experience their phones not working, They'll want to have a backup of physical currency. And the, the other thing I'd say is I don't see people being able to innovate in any way that's good for society and growth, such that taking away cash and having very negative rates will be in a, a world we live in. I think mildly negative rates for certain reasons, like Sweden has, you might want to have. But the notion of having a minus 5% rate without changing the financial system in a fundamental way, I think, is a pipe dream. It's uh, very challenging, and um, come back to that too. Um, Stefan. Well, thank you. Uh, 
Last night when I read my emails, there was one email saying that I'm a CEO in Silicon Valley and I'm quite deeply involved in planning a pathway for central banks to absorb and use cryptocurrencies. I get these types of e emails actually quite, quite often. So this happens right now and it's not theory anymore. And that of course then raises the question, what is money? Well, money is actually what's in our heads because money is a convention. That's what it is. And it's a convention which can rely on different technologies using the plural. And that is also exactly the way it's been in the past. But what it gets hard for us today when we discuss these things is that everything we have today comes, was created about a hundred or a little more than a hundred years ago. And everything then back then was based on the assumption that everything is on paper. Now we're moving into a world where nothing will be on paper, mostly. And that's when it gets difficult when we start thinking about these structures, thinking about the architecture. And that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the hard part. Now, part of it is IT technology, but the Silicon, Silicon Valley man, he is a, a technology guy. He talks about this from a technological perspective, which is not really the key to money, because you can do this in many different, many different ways. Because money requires a legal framework. And parliaments, governments decide what the legal framework is supposed to look like. You can't really create money out of the blue, even if you try to, calling it Bitcoin or whatever you like, because it's going to require a legal framework of, of, in, of one form or, or the other. And that also gets you into the public good aspects of money and what money is good, uh, good for. And that takes us into the field of monetary theory, which is actually quite different from monetary policy, which is a completely different topic. And that means that today, when technology changes, we go through a phase where age-old issues resurface. But there is almost nothing new under the sun when it comes to money, and most of it has actually been tried and from time to time also failed in the past, but in a world where technologies were uh, uh, different. And I do think that money is too important for the private sector only to deal with, and private initiatives uh, tend to crash uh, sooner or later. But having said that, I do think that we on the central banking side have been too complacent, and we cert certainly have some homework to do, uh, and I'll get back, get to that uh, uh, during the second, uh, second item. And that means that it's time to discuss the plumbing. Most people are not comfortable discussing the plumbing. Most people just ignore the plumbing until it backs up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we have this very, very rare and fascinating seminar and panel here, here today. And I think that that's a good, good, good thing. Let me give you a few examples dealing with plumbing issues because I'm, I'm come from the plumbing side when it comes to money. Today, when it comes to setting up a securities depository system, setting up a cent central clearing organization, or setting up a stock exchange, all of it is IT and you can buy this stuff off shelf. In the future, it will be also possible to buy a monetary system off shelf in terms of the IT parts of it. And a fairly large number of small countries will actually be forced more or less to buy these systems off shelf because they can't produce them themselves. It's just too hard to do. And that raises some uh, very fundamental issues like how do we answer the question where is my money? If the answer is it's in the cloud. <laughs> what cloud? Whose cloud? And that's because IT changes all of this because we're trained to think about money in physical terms, in spatial terms, and in national terms. And none of that necessarily holds in the future because just give, let me give you an example. We can, um, we can create the IT system in country A, we can have the servers located in country B, and we can actually use the system in country C. Now in that environment, you have to cooperate, you have to standardize, and you have to create trust. And without that, these systems uh, won't work. And what this really means, if you think about money or using the plural monies uh, from a small economy perspective, usually it's about monetary policy, it's about financial stability, but we have to add a third aspect of it, which is ease of use. 
And you have to have those three at the same time. And that's how you uh, create a product called money, whatever the name of a currency happens to be, that produces uh, value, uh, value added. And uh, if you mess up on one of them, you probably end up with a problem and people will go and use somebody else's money. There are probably very large returns to scales when it comes to setting up these systems. And there might be in the future an element of the winner takes all, or if not all, a lot. And that means that nation states will have to uh, make their choices going forward. But one thing is for sure, you can't turn back time. Thanks. Uh, just let me, um, since we're discussing what might happen, so we've just got a few minutes um, to think um, uh, about that. And I have two questions, and you don't all have to respond. But I'd like to start with you, Hyun. Um I have lots of interest in this idea, you this uh, analogy you have, the technology and architecture. And I was thinking about that. I was thinking, well, w when you're in a building, I'm moderately interested in the architecture, but I'm even more interested in the engineering and the building. I, it might be beautifully designed, but it's not much good if it falls on my head. Um, now, we'll come to that in a second, um, in the second uh, part. But there's an another question in this world which we might be moving to, which Marcus has laid out, in which a large part of what the current monetary system does will shift to completely new players, or indeed already has, what do you think the biggest issues are in managing the stability um, during this transition, which might be long or quick, of all the existing players who do provide the other services. Um, and, and how do you think about just the process whereby banks lose the payment system? Um, what would that look like? Um, and what sort of problems might that just that process create? So Martin, these are uh, very big very big questions, and uh, of course we struggle with this all the time. Let me uh, address it like this. Um, big techs have become very big players uh, in a number of uh, areas. As I said, you know, they rely on this DNA loop, the data network activities loop, where as they provide services in social media, in e-commerce, and in search, that generates a lot of data. The data is the input into a lot of the activities. And that, that, then that begets more activity, with, which then generates you know, even more data. And in the annual economic report, we, we, ha we cite an example of where you know, credit <coughs> assessment becomes, um, if you then unleash machine learning onto this big data, it just becomes a very different game from the usual credit assessment where you're looking at uh, the balance sheet or the, or the uh, income statement of the borrower. Because you can actually look at the whole network, and as the saying goes, you can judge someone by the character of their friends. So if you look at the whole network, you can actually glean, glean a lot more about the credit worthiness of someone by looking at the transactions that you know, that particular player does with all the other members. Now, this does mean that uh, um, banks, as they, uh, uh, which are still the, the most important incumbents, um, will face stiff competition. On the other hand, the way that the, the, the architecture is evolving is very interesting because uh, as, Governor Brainerd, uh, as Governor Brainerd mentioned, I think the example of China is a very interesting example. And there what you're seeing is, although we have these two very large players who have their own walled garden, as it were, uh, their own network effects, the policy response has been to bring them back into the two-tier system because uh, now they're, sub they're subject to 100% reserve requirements so that they are now plugged into the central bank's balance sheet in a much more secure way than they were before. And in some ways, uh, you, know, that is a, um, you know, that is coming back to the conventional two-tier system, even though their business models enable them to really um, uh, to, uh, harness the DNA loop. So I think what we're seeing is um, 
it's not just a one-way street. I think we are seeing uh, an evolution of the system where, uh, and I think this is a lesson for us, where we can um, aim for a, um, a very stable backbone where the public goods are provided publicly. And public goods can be provided privately as well. But I think for the payment system, for the underlying core infrastructure, that's probably best provided publicly by the, you know, by the central bank. And then we allow uh, the full creativity of the private sector with their technology, with the, um, uh, you know, with their creativity in being able to serve customers to do their stuff. Thank you very much. That sort of elucidates some of what you were talking about earlier. Let's move on and then we'll all come back. I think that's a wonderful opening for you, Stefan, because uh, you are going to, so we could turn to the question of the appropriate official regulatory and policy response uh, to these developments. So uh, um, John has presented a rather benign view of happy cooperation between the central banks doing the public good stuff and the private sector doing what it does best, um, uh, particularly in innovating the payments process. Um, in this context, that's the aspect of money we're mostly focusing on here. Um, how do you see, from your point of view, the issues, and in that context particularly, because I, we know that this is something you're thinking about, the possibility of um, the provision of central bank digital money directly to the, the public? Well, thank you. Good question, Andrew, because there's, again, as I said, there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to money, because uh, one way or the other, my institution has made it possible for the public to hold Riggs Bank money for 350 years. And now we're embroiled in a conversation whether one should allow that to disappear because physical money is likely to disappear. And that's at the end of the day is going to require a political judgment. Uh, it's not for central bankers to decide which way that should, uh, should, should, should go. But uh, one way of thinking about this is to say, and, and, and here I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I'm citing Benoit Curie, who said, same business, same risk, same rules. That's one way of thinking about it when it comes to these new types of systems that are uh, emerging. But let me say a few words about my vision uh, when it comes to uh, where, where we are heading. And I'm, of course, talking about this from my own national perspective. And I think it's important to keep in mind here that uh, where money and payment systems are intertwined. And that's really, really uh, the key uh, to it. And so my vision uh, when it comes to all of this, and I'm of course talking about it from a central bank perspective because my job is to produce Swedish kroner, and my job is to make sure that that's good stuff and that people use it in, in a world where there's a bit of uh, competition. So uh, six bullets uh, that I have in mind. First, it should be possible to make both large value and retail pay payments in central bank money in real time, anytime, 24-7, all year round. Second, when it comes to this, it's also important over time to make sure that we can make cross-currency and cross-border payments, at least for low-value payments in central bank money, in real time at, and also at any time. Third, should be possible, there should be a definition of legal tender that is suited for the digital age. In our case, digital legal tender is tied to physical banknotes. And if banknotes more or less disappear, people don't use them anymore, well, then we don't know what legal tender is anymore. And that, beco that becomes a, an issue that will come back and that we have to uh, deal with. Fourth, there should be a digital currency issued by the central bank, and that digital currency uh, should be legal tender. Now, there is a distinction here between a wholes wholesale central bank money and retail central bank money. So I'm not talking about wholesale because that we already have and had for, have had for a long time. Sixth issue, uh, fifth issue, sorry. And this is central actually to the whole thing, but people rarely talk about it. To make this work in a d digital world, it's absolutely crucial for financial inclusion and regulatory purposes to have a government-sponsored, decided digital identification. Because without that, if you can't explain in a digital form who you are, 
then you can't really run these systems. And you also need this when it comes to know your customer, anti-money laundering, and all the rest of it. And then the sixth issue, which is very, very uh, basic, and, and, and Simon referred to it already, uh, if, if the electricity goes out, you still need physical banknotes somewhere in the country, and you need to have a uh, system to distribute them in case you have a problem of, uh, of, of some sort. Where you hold the cash in between when people don't use cash, that's my job, and it's nobody else's business to understand where the money is at. <laughs> <laughs> they only need to understand that it's going to be available, and it's my job and to make sure that my, my staff will, will make that um, happen. So what does this mean? Well, essentially, my vision is listing the same responsibilities that we have today. Uh, but in an IT-based uh, uh, world, uh, where, which is quite, uh, quite different. But so in that sense, uh, there's nothing new under the sun, despite the fact that technologies uh, uh, change. But everything I said is basically dealing with plumbing issues, but plumbing issues in real time. And that's different compared to what we've had in the past. Thank you very much. That's very, very useful, very, very clear. Um, so what's the perspective that you have, Simon, from uh, on the policy issues that this um, emergence of new um, digital systems, particularly digital payment systems of enormous scale, what, what, what sort of issues does that create for the existing um, regulators, but the regulators and the, the challenges they're going to have to resolve. So I think you heard today in Lael's speech, one of the concerns is the two-tier system we have is very good at doing things that central banks aren't good at. Who, who exactly should get credit? How do we follow that? How do we work out how to transfer risk, whether it be locally or across the globe? There's no reason banks that the central bank should have any particular skill in that. I, I, I often say to people, I actually know of a central bank that used to do all of this. It was the People's Bank of China. And they decided in the, in the late 70s that that wasn't the best use of the People's Bank of China. And it seems to have worked out well for them. They, they do have state-run banks, but they delegate to them a lot of how to extend credit, how to transfer risk. If, if you are going to keep a two-tier system and the you issue a central bank digital currency, whether it's account-based or token-based, how do you control that from taking away the funding of the traditional system? You had one version of that. Let, let's just think of a version where of the 10 to 11 trillion of, of deposits in the US that might move, five, 5 trillion move. And the central bank needs to get 5 trillion on the asset side. Does it buy treasuries for that? If it buys treasuries for that, then the government's going to have to fund someone. If it loans to banks, then it's going to have to decide, is it happy with that? The other argument, and I think this is the most critical one, is it's unlikely that you would see that much transfer of, of deposits from the private sector to the public sector in normal times. We've had postal banks. Uh, Treasury Direct is, is there right now. You can go and just hold T-bills in a direct way. In a time when you're worried about banks, just at the wrong time, everyone would then take their money out and put it in, into the central bank because that's the individually efficient thing to do, and you shouldn't argue with that. So that would make dealing with runs much harder. How can you deal with this? If we're trying to deal with the retail payments, they're not that big. That was, if, if your slide was there, you, could, you can't see them in the, in the US one. So you can easily limit the size of, of the accounts, whether they be token-based or account-based. You can have a stable coin or outsource how, how those are run. The central bank doesn't have to do that, but the government does have to regulate them, and it needs to regulate them in some distinct ways. The first one is to make sure, and this is not a feature of the current system, that people who are underbanked or unbanked don't get ripped off as much as they do right now with the ATM fees and other things. That seems pretty easy, and it's low-hanging fruit in the US. That Europe, Sweden doesn't have that. It's a much more if, if efficient system. That seems like a pressing need to fix that in the near term. The other one is the data that is being used. It should be the case that the people who are going to use your data 
pay you for using that data. And the more that you can construct a system where there's some regulation around that, the better off you will be. The one thing you probably want to make clear when you're doing this, and this goes back to my last point, is this is not an attempt to get deeply negative nominal rates. You're not trying to get to a point you can do that. That would, be, uh, would destabilize the financial system in the transition. Yes, your turn. Just, uh, I mean, just the following up on, on Stefan's uh, six points, I think his fifth one, which was on the importance of a system of digital ID, I think this is really, really crucial. I think um, I've described uh, how in many countries, uh, retail payments um, using technology is incredibly seamless and, uh, and, and uh, very easy, but cross-border payment still is the bottleneck. And I think this is where uh, we have a, a lot more work to do. Partly, it, the impediments are technological. Um, and uh, this is where the limits of the account-based money uh, come in. Uh, because typically, if you try and make a cross-border payment using account-based money, you have to go through several intermediaries. Uh, and the reason is uh, you need an intermediary where both the receiver and the sender have to have deposits so that you can transfer the, the deposits from the payer to the, to the receiver. Um, but more important is, uh, are, are the know, um, know your customer checks where they can be very onerous, they can be very um, uh, time consuming. And uh, you know, we uh, come across these figures all the time. The uh, you know, World Bank has done a study where if you make a $200 payment, you're spending $14 just as, you know, just as a fee, typically. I think this is one area where, uh, from a financial inclusion perspective, we, we really need to make progress. And I think having a digital ID system where, which allows the payment systems across countries to talk to each other is going to be a very, very important first step. That, and for a that, global ID? No, not a, oh. not a global ID, but at least uh, having uh, the, the opening up the possibility where, the, uh, where payment systems uh, of two different jurisdictions can actually... Uh, make the KYC process much more seamless. And, uh, and um, I think if we can address this issue, uh, many of the, uh, the arguments one hears for why stable coins, global stable coins are going to be, uh, um, you know, are, are in fact necessary, are in fact going to um, you know, improve customer experience, I think, will be uh, in a much less strong. Uh, but this is one area where we have to acknowledge as policymakers, that the progress has been least satisfactory. I'd add a couple of things to that. And, and where it gets hard when, when we talk about where to draw the line between, between the central bank and, and, and uh, the private sector is, is we are so accustomed to having central banks. So what you really need to think through is what would the system look without a central bank completely? And that takes you back to the 1800s in the U.S., for example, and, and all the issues that uh, people were through back in, uh, back in those, uh, those days. And I'm not talking about using somebody else's currency, somebody else's central bank. I'm talking about the intellectual case when you think through no central bank at all, none, anywhere, anywhere in the world, and what you, what you get. And then usually people would up, come up with the conclusion that we need a central bank. So then you would re reinvent the central bank. Regulation, you definitely need it. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? Regulation, you need it. That's in the 50s. They went to the 1850s. They went to more regulation. One, one issue that... You couldn't, without a central bank, you couldn't have our financial system. So um, uh, the, um, you'd really be starting from scratch. But let me add one issue that we're referring to Hume's reflection when it comes to cross-border uh, payments and why this is a relevant issue as of, as of today. We're presently uh, uh, talking to the ECB about using their real-time low-value gross settlement system that runs 24-7 for euros. But starting in 2021, if we can come to an agreement with the ECB, we can use the system uh, for Swedish kroner. And what that means that we have two currencies running real time, 
you probably don't have to be Einstein's brother to fix, figure out how to do the switch. And given that we're actually talking about the same computer system and the same servers, and that means that if we can solve that in harmony uh, among in, within the central bank community, then I just can't see what the value added uh, of Libra would be in that environment. But anyway, that's my view. It's a competitive business. Um, it's very important for you that this be closed soon because we started very, very late. So um, I was proposing to, to allow them to talk a little bit longer. But if you want to close it, I will do so. The logistical interruption. Point one, if people are content to let the geniuses talk longer, I think you will get value out of it. I will put a hard deadline at 545 because we want people to have a chance to eat and drink. Second, I thank Martin for stepping in. I apologize for not having made the seamless transition to Martin. I was coughing and I didn't want to distract, so I stepped out. Third, whenever this is done, Marcus gets the last word. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You have described perfectly how we intended to proceed, so it's what we're going to do. Um, at this stage, I have many, many further questions, huge number, but I, in the next, say, 10, 15 minutes, well, let's have some questions, and then we'll allow Marcus. I'm going to allow each of them to have another 30 seconds or so to summarize the single most important thing you should take away from what they said, and then we'll have Marcus. So any questions? Uh, please, the same rules apply, say who you are, and stand up. Um, then you will be, Patrick, you will be the next one. Thank you. This has been a fantastic panel. Thank you very much. I've learned a lot. Uh, so I raised this question to, oh, sorry, I'm Don Hay uh, from the IMF. Uh, so um, I asked this question to Marcus earlier at lunchtime. So I'm going to ask the same question to the other panelists. So in a way, I very much agree with uh, Marcus that the unit of account is probably the most uh, important function of money. And of course, that's what uh, central banks care most about. So why do you think that Libra, as is proposed, has a different unit of, unit of account? Might have it been much easier if they had proposed a Libra that's packed only to the US dollar. So what is the reason? So do we have to worry about that platform monies? Even if it's not a Libra, similar concepts might survive. Why do they have incentive to have a different unit of account? Thank you. The way I'm going to do this, my normal way, we're not going, you're not going to answer these questions. I'm going to take three, two or three, then I'll decide which of them are going to be asked and in which order. This is, this is not a democracy. Uh, Patrick, uh, yes, please. Patrick Honan, uh, Peterson Institute. I, I, my question about Libra, really, and, and the excitement that this has generated. So what, why do we think Libra is, uh, you know, could, could be big very quickly? It's because, I suppose, because they have a large number of affiliates at the moment, you know, of members, who trust the brand, and it's credible that this big company can work a, a payments, credible payments technology. So that explains why they might get a huge uh, portion of the retail payment system. But it's not clear to me why this should attract, in any short term time uh, scale, a large portion of the wholesale payment system, or any large scale at all of the store of value. Uh, why they should be able to compete with uh, you know BlackRock, um, Vanguard, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Am I completely wrong about that? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying that in 50 years' time it won't be all big tech companies, but this particular initiative seems smaller than the amount of reaction that we're getting from about it. Thank. You. Thank you. I'm with um, Bloomberg News. Can I ask for your uh, broad take on China's push to create its own uh, digital currency, the central bank digital currency? Uh, the design of it certainly uh, differs a lot from what, it's, what we uh, talk about today, uh, the, the digital currency for general purpose. Um, what's your view on their uh, 
approach and what would be the implication on uh, either Alipay or WeChat or um, other monetary authorities over overseas trying to look at a similar topic. Thank you. So there are two questions and we can bring them together about Libra. Um, what on earth were they thinking? I think is the first one. Um, and why? I have a view, but I'm not a panelist. And surely there are inherent limits in what it can achieve, um, particularly out beyond the, re the retail system, which I think is a very important point about these platforms. And in Facebook case, it's not a trusted transaction platform anyway. So it would seem to sort of make sense for Amazon um, because it is a trusted pay, uh, transactions platform. My own humble view, and I'm on the record there, so anyone who trusts Facebook for anything uh, is a deluded fool. But the anyway, anyone wants to talk specifically about the Libra idea because it's obviously a big issue. Hyun, are you prepared to say something about it? Well, to Patrick's question, uh, I alluded earlier to the to the limits of a of a um, cash in advance system for for wholesale payments. If you have to top up your uh, your wallet before you make the payment, and you cannot be overdrawn, uh, given the kind of uh, sums we are talking about in the wholesale payment system, where you're actually paying uh, the annual GDP in one week, uh, it's not going to be um, uh, you know a very uh, in an efficient way to, to run the wholesale payment system. On the store of value, it's also very interesting uh, just to look at the magnitudes for, for Alipay and WeChat Pay as well, because although they're very important players in the payment system, uh, if you look at uh, their balances, including the money market funds, if you add up the whole of the assets of the, uh, of the payment float together with the money market fund, we only get to about 2% of the total deposits in the banking system in China. So it is a very, very small part of, uh, of the overall financial assets. Um, so I think we have to you know, keep these things in perspective. I think the, um, the interest that Libra has generated, uh, I think it's, it goes back to what I was referring to earlier, which is the idea that uh, you can use the, um, the installed network base and uh, then uh, exploit that in the payment, in the provision of payment services, and uh, the possibility that you could get a, a walled garden, um, which is separate from the public backbone. And I think that I think the uh, I think some of the uh, um, background to to the misgivings that some people have, uh, expressed. So, since uh, do you want to add anything on Libra? So I think it's pretty obvious why they wanted a basket, given the 2.7 billion people on all located in this country. On the other hand, it'd be much easier to tell people it's backed by reserves held at the Federal Reserve. That would make everyone realize it was actually stable in value. It gets very hard to explain to people when it's a basket that it's stable, but you, you don't know whether it's really stable. People would do a lot of transactions in, in dollars. That shows you that the politics of this are quite difficult. Private actors aren't necessarily perfect at trying to deal with this. In terms of China, I don't know what the details are there. I will say that we, we Bank is an interesting entity there, where they use some of this data and they extend credit in a very quick way without ever having met people. They do use a lot of data to extend that credit, and it's not obvious in other countries we feel so happy with that. It's a very uh, interesting way. And just to go back to my point, we shouldn't knock Facebook too much here. They could be tremendous value. It might not be measured in GDP, but there could be some value here of how, how to connect people that we are missing. And I, I think you were trying to indicate that in, in the, the paper you wrote, that these platforms have told us quite a bit about what, what people value. It might not be measured in GDP, but it could be something that has a lot of social value. Just two point very quickly. I think this cross-border aspect of Libra is, the, if it works, the core unique selling point, and it's a big deal. And that comes out, you said, so because cross-border payments is an unspeakable mess, particularly for small transactors. 
Um, the second point is I did see the PPOC at some length in March to talk about this, and they very much underlined what uh, Hun said, that really and truly, if you looked at what the, the big payment uh, platforms do in monetary terms in China, and the, even in payments, because they're not doing all the corporate payments and all the rest of it, it's very much smaller than the numbers sometimes suggest. Finally, Stefan, do you have anything to say on the PBOC? Well, it's, I mean, it's too early to tell. I, I certainly don't know what they're going to come up with and what they're going to do. But there is one more, one aspect to all of this, uh, which is, uh, again, repeating there's nothing new under the sun. My understanding is that for these new systems, they're now imposing a 100% reserve requirement. And that's exactly the conversation that we had in the late 1800s in my country, uh, when the banks were issuing physical money and the central bank was issuing physical central bank, bank money. And then there was also a very harsh re reserve requirement imposed on the banks, and that ensured that you had an exchange rate one-to-one -one between central bank money and private bank money. And uh, without that, uh, the system simply would not, would not have worked. And, this is why I think they have come up with this conclusion, uh, and, and that's the way it's going to be run uh, presently. Because that's where you really have to decide whether you want to have a, a sort of a enumerator an, or an exchange rate which is easy to understand one-to-one -one in the system. And if that goes out the window, then everybody will revert, revert back to central bank money in one form or the other. I'm going to take one or possibly two questions if they're really quick. So this is your first. Please uh, say who you are and very, very quick question. Uh, Yan Qing uh, from East High Media Group. Very quickly, if we think uh, private uh, invested or stable coin money like Libra is very dangerous, should we have a uh, global central banking issued kind of from BIS issued a, a kind of ESDR? Uh, it will be safer, or uh, will, will uh, ESDR uh, dominate the uh, global monetary system if the SDR fail to do that? And very quickly, for Han, uh, you I'm have... sorry, a, we're going to have to do oh, one question. I'm sorry, you. because I'm going to be okay, killed if I let it go on. Jean, and that'll be the last one. I'm really sorry, but uh, you can ask them privately. A very simple question. 60 years ago, uh, American Express introduced a credit card. So it was substituting cash, it was substituting checks, it was a way to provide credit, and it provided uh, massive information to the provider of a, of, a, of a credit card, and nothing changed. So what is the difference this time? Okay, um, who wants to talk about central bank, uh, no, sorry, um, an ESDR, could it do substantially better than the uh, original SDR has in being a, a successful reserve asset, in this case turning presumably into successful money. Simon, you're shaking your head, so... The dollar works really well, and the network effects are massive. You're not going to get people to coordinate uh, in any real time on this. There are issues to how dominant the dollar is. That's why Governor Carney gave the speech he gave at Jackson Hole. But he kept on saying, you've got to play the cards you have. And the notion that this is going to change over the next five years, it, it, it's not going to happen. The dollar is actually growing in importance. And the fact that uh, we talked a lot about Facebook Libra, if you look over the last few weeks, I don't think people's view of the success of that has gone up. I think it's gone close to zero. So Hyun and uh, Stefan, last, um, Sean is essentially asking the question, is it really different this time? And in fact, Marcus started this with his discussion of the e-money debate was, what, 20 years ago? I can't remember the exact figures. So we've had credit cards, we've had payment cards. It hasn't really changed anything. Are we uh, getting much too excited about what a change in technology when it really is not going to change the core architecture? Marcus is putting forward the argument that his co-authors that it really could change the core architecture. So from your perceptions, you two, what do you think very quickly? Is it how, how different is it this time? I think the short answer is it remains to be seen. <laughs> because um, it, I, I think it's the only answer because um, I think it's too early to tell. There is a lot of excitement about the technology. But take 
even the simple example of uh, decentralized consensus, uh, consensus and distributed ledger technology, that is um, a, uh, so the technology and the cryptographic um, uh, way of keeping track of who pays whom uh, has been an advance, but it remains to be seen how widely that's going to be adop uh, adopted and, uh, and will make an impact. And the initial indications are um, uh, that it uh, is a very exciting idea. It goes back to some of the roots of monetary economics, that we have a huge ledger that says who pays whom, and we can keep tabs rather than having pieces of paper or gold coins. But um, And there's no doubt that technology has enabled us to realize some of these theoretical ideas in practice. However, the returns that, we're getting, that, that we've seen so far have been rather meager. And uh, we'll need to see how far the technology is going to drive the function. And I think this is, I would go back to my very first point. The technology is an enabler. It's not the end. And very briefly, if central banks uh, adapt and start using new technologies themselves, uh, then uh, central banks will continue to be around for a long, long time to come. Had we stuck to... 45 pound copper coins uh, from the 1600s until today, we probably would not have existed. That's a nice answer. So Marcus, um, a few minutes of uh, reaction to what you've heard, but really make it very brief. Okay. Let me first thank all of you for a great panel and also to the audience for being here till the end. Uh, let me make a few comments which I collected as different views. I think one thing which is striking that the uh, age old issues resurfaced, and I agree, and it's an exciting time that you can restudy essentially all monetary theory. But I think there is one difference, and Simon pointed to it as well. I think it's connection to platforms and the data connection. I think it's way more pronounced this time, uh, and I think that's the new element combined with the token which really makes this evolution, I think, different. It's also leading in terms of speed whenever there's a financial crisis to much, much faster development. The other difference I see is that the danger of dollarization or digital dollarization is probably much more pronounced compared to credit cards. Uh, I don't see that, you know, a credit card is still in your national currency. It's not, I don't see that suddenly a foreign denominated credit card is taking over as a country. I don't think it's an issue for the U.S., uh, because the dollar is very dominant in all this, but for smaller countries, very open countries, that's, I think, a, a large, uh, larger issue. Um, with regard to retail transactions, I agree that retail is small, but it might be the most lucrative way. So the spreads, you know, you can do on, on the retail side, you can uh, probably make uh, a lot of money, and that's probably what... Uh, uh, Am uh, not Amazon, Facebook and others are looking at, say, I can have a lot of deposits and going back to the Starbucks example, they don't get any interest on this uh, money they're lending to Starbucks and that's very lucrative and Facebook probably sees there will be perhaps a billion dollars or some billion dollars you can borrow for free uh, in a high interest rate environment, a high inflation environment, that's very, very lucrative. Uh, you won't get this from professional investors because a lot of this uh, financial transactions might be algo trading to a large extent, all shows up in this, uh, this wholesale uh, transactions. So that's why I wouldn't downplay the, the retail side too much. I agree the financial inclusion is the big component. I think that's one, I don't see it with Libra suddenly doing a huge financial inclusion, but I think that should be uh, the argument we should go to forward. Um, I see a big disagreement on the panel with regard to CBDC. Uh, I think Stefan is very uh, in favor of it, and I think uh, Sweden is going forward with that. Uh, Simon is very against it. Um, or in small perhaps, size, it's okay. In small size, it's okay. Um, so there is a, a big debate still ongoing. I don't think we have resolved that. Um, and finally, I would like to come back to what the Martin mentioned in the beginning. Uh, it might be a better way, the whole evolution or revolution might actually lead to a much more efficient system, especially more financial inclusions. We don't know yet how it will look like, but the transition is actually very difficult and very risky, and it might take a century and two financial crises. 
and a great depression to get it, I get there, so it might be very risky. So coming back to Lil Brennard's uh, presentation, why should the US do it? Why should we risk the whole global financial system with a dollar? Let's just do it with a small country. And I uh, hope that Stefan is offering Sweden to, <laughs> to be the experimenter. And I think in return, we should uh, offer some backup Land of last resort policy towards Sweden, because we all learn, the whole world will learn from the Swedish experiment, or perhaps Israel or some other country which is very much technologically driven, um, can move ahead. And I, I hope that for human beings or for the innovation itself, that some countries move ahead with some guarantees from other countries uh, to do that. And Thank you very much, John. Um, I think the distinction. Okay, I'm going to conclude, but I'd just like to end up with, I think somebody mentioned John Bush's view on uh, uh, economic processes and the crisis when it happens is quicker than you ever imagine. I, my memory now, I've forgotten this, about 20 years ago, and I think it was Bill Gates, but it might have been somebody else, made essentially the same point about technology. This is the beginning of the dot-com bubble and all the rest of it. And uh, the argument was essentially fundamentally new technologies change the world much more slowly than most people originally expect, but in the end they change it completely. And I have a pretty strong suspicion that uh, in this case, though I wish it weren't the case, or in some ways I don't, that this is going to be an example that this is the case. So it won't be a completely different financial world five years from now, but 20 years from now, I suspect it will be. And so we should prepare for that. I think it's been a wonderful panel, and uh, now I'm going to leave Adam to conclude it.